Hello, welcome to Behind Your Sofa, or Pillow, depending on your living room. If you were to ask me what made Doctor Who different to other popular sci-fi shows, then one of the many reasons I would bring up would be the way in which the horror doesn't attempt to be cold or distant, but it is the way in which it takes place under your bed or inside your cupboard. The monsters are something you see every day, or they're something that breathes on the back of your neck when you're not looking. Even some of its more outlandish concepts that take place in the far future or on different planets still manage to get under your skin at the idea of finding them in your room or in an inescapable fate like the Cyberman. It's this relatable element that gives that makes Doctor Who's horror value so impactful and to me there is no other episode that the revival has given us which demonstrates this particular form of horror better than the story Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead. This episode is perfect at showcasing the core appeal of Doctor Who, as it doesn't just make you want to hide behind your sofa, but it makes you too scared to even do that due to the fact that the monster of the week could now be anywhere in your living room. This is shown by introducing the audience through an ordinary setting of a family living room where the majority of the audience will be watching from. We are immediately endeared to the world of the library as we see it through the eyes of a child who visits it by floating through the buildings that are miles taller than anything you may see on Earth. The camera then settles in one of the millions of rooms this planet has by moving slowly and softly and at the same speed as the child herself before we cut to a different angle suddenly. This jarring movement from one slow establishing shot to several different shots of varying angles not only disorientates the girl but also the audience as well meaning that when the Doctor and Donna burst through the doors not smiling and all happy to see our favourite time travelling duo but were confused at how they managed to infiltrate the most bizarre and unreal location we could ever imagine the TARDIS visiting, that of a child's imagination. This shot is also done from the point of view of Cal, the main character in the scene, to further cement the idea that this is not an ordinary place, and that the Doctor and Donna should not be here. The line from the Doctor, is it okay if we stop here for a bit, is benefited by the fact that the point of view angle makes it look like the Doctor is breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to the audience. This scene is not the cream of the crop when it comes to com the contemporary horror of the episode, but acts as the perfect way to establish the tone and feel of the episode and also set up the further horror feeling as if your personal life is being invaded. So straight after the title sequence and we get some fun Dr Donna babbling. Interestingly, this scene was added last minute by Moffat as the scripts were running short and he needed to some quote unquote waffling to pad it out. This works perfectly however as it introduces the main mystery of the episode through some wonderfully dark humour, Donna insisting that the books can't be the life forms that were detected, only to then see the Doctor's face, making the audience roll their eyes like Donna does before realising that of course this is possible, because it is too plausible not to be. And we slowly invest until the sudden jump scare pulls you out of it and back to reality. This scene plays with the audience and further makes you warm to the mystery. Something else that this opening scene achieves is managing to avoid rushing everything. Classic Who guarded some criticism at times for being too padded out when scripts were running short, and is one of the main reasons that some new Who fans don't want to go back and watch them. However, this episode manages to escape this pitfall by using the padding to act as a piece of world building, helping to draw the audience in by endearing them to this time period they have arrived in, by showing us that it's not too different to our own time, but it also acts as a setup for a needed plot device later on in the story that is also responsible for the cliffhanger and for demonstrating the stakes for the second half of the story. This is because throughout the conversation in this part of the episode, the fact that they are dead faces on the nodes is a key part of the humour. It's such a small setup and detail, but the fact that Moffat managed to escape the temptation of simply making characters run up and down the corridors for an extra 10 minutes shows how well he could write Doctor Who, and gave the fans who were worried about him taking over as showrunner reassurance that he could write Doctor Who perfectly. The scene where we discover why the Doctor and Donna ended up inside the mind of a child also doesn't feel like a cop-out because it isn't written as some kind of lazy explanation, seeing as the location that they actually have entered to, a planet that's also a library, is actually quite fancy-like and not something that the audience would be expecting. This makes it truly satisfying, uh, opposed to what could have been a really clickbaity opening scene just for pulling viewers in. When I started writing this video, I was intending on just focusing on the horror that the story has as a whole, rather than going into any specifics of uh, particular scenes, 
but I just couldn't resist talking about this opening in depth because less than 10 minutes in and we've already avoided falling into padding, had some fun Dr. Donna babbling, had the stakes built up for the cliffhanger and also had the probably one of the best cold opening in the show's history upon so much more. If this doesn't show how much of a perfect episode of Doctor Who this story is, then I truly don't know what does. The most obvious example of horror in this episode is of course the Vashna Narada, which is still one of my favourite Moffat creations and also stands as one of the best and most original villain ideas in the whole series. Their ending is also immensely satisfying and reminds me of the way in which the Daleks were killed in their original story, where they were destined to just be trapped forever inside of a cold metallic casing, where they were just to rot away with no way of escaping the eternal torture. I also love the idea of the library being a vast, open, dead space filled with flesh-eating creatures around every corner. It's very reminiscent of Stanley Kubrick or Alfred Hitchcock, where there could be these immense settings where the movie has just taken place that are just left to stand for the rest of time. I always judge a terrifying ending to a film like that by imagining how scary it would be if I was there alone, if I was stuck in a town where killer birds were king, or if I was driving alone, got stuck and came across an empty hotel filled with nightmares. This episode, intentionally or not, leaves this place fully open for anyone to enter, then to get lost in, and unknowingly be eaten. It's really very effective. And this also really gets inside the minds of the viewers as well, by having the planet majorly resemble any ordinary Earth construct, making your next trip to the library a very terrifying concept. It has a similar impact uh, that the Weeping Angels did, where any statue could be plotted to kill you, a shadow could be waiting to eat your flesh. There is also that great moment by the Doctor where he talks about the vast narada that are on Earth and how the people who don't always come out of the dark could have fallen victim to some of, some of these creatures. I also like the fourth wall breaking of this scene where the dust and sun beams could potentially be the vast narada as well. This is especially terrifying as a child because it means that if you were to go and run behind your sofas then there is every possibility that a shadow behind the sofa could be trying to kill you. And admit it, who else used to stare at just in some memes when they were younger and think they were fashion and errata? So the first part, and a fair bulk of the second, managed to scare its audience by using the power and emotional impact of the Vashta Narada to further its plot. That's good, that's a near perfect way to handle a two-part, where the first episode was all about introducing the concepts and using that to scare the audience, while also setting up some character-based horror that it can use and build on in the second. The way in which this is done is through the idea of what happens when you're pulled out of the library and placed into a dream reality, or whatever it is. The mysteries established in the first part come to blossom here in some of the most satisfying ways possible, and that is through Donna's use of the episode. Another great thing that this episode excels at doing is demonstrating the effect of the vast narada. There is no way your audience is going to be scared of your villain if you don't show someone in so consequential getting killed by them. Moffat, however, makes sure for this death to land harder than it would with some rando, and he lets the audience sympathise with her as a character. Somebody wants to do well and means well, but is held back by her intelligence, or lack thereof. The scene where her body was found is also was also added to the script last minute, due to it running short, as I imagine she would have just been caught in a hit and run incident. But again, instead of some filler, the scene builds towards raising the stakes for the final act of the story, and further demonstrating the immediate stakes of the characters by introducing the after-image concept. I wonder what the scene would have been like before being rewritten, because it's responsible for this introduction of the after-image, which I'm also a fan of this device because it adds world-building to this time period, by also making it seem more alien. It's something we can relate to, but something we don't have. All of the characters are used to watching their loved ones degrade in front of them to the point where they are just cracking jokes. But luckily Donna is here as the perfect audience surrogate to give this moment the levity it needs to balance the world building and also its emotional impact. Also, quick side note to talk about the direction. The pullback shot of the characters looking at the gnarled skeleton is spine chilling, especially the way in which she's saying ice cream. And it's also an in, in, almost an inhumane way to die as she is robbed of her ability to even scream. She is sent to a presumably torturous afterlife. The only real problem with this ending to the Vash Narada, to the whole story, in which the way they destroy them, is that it's too satisfying, because there's no new or creative way to combat or beat them after you've shown them do this, something this harsh and this damaging, only to then destroy them with something that really would have taken a lot of work. Making another story or a sequel is more or less an imaginative impossibility, 
I mean, I know Big Finish did some stories with them, which I haven't listened to because, come on, look at the prices. But also because I haven't heard overwhelmingly positive things about them. But anyway, that's enough of part one. And that isn't everything that this story does to terrify you. Let's jump forward and look at how Forest of the Dead manages to make seemingly ordinary play parks and family living rooms the place of nightmares. So the side plot opens with Cal watching the episode we are also seeing on a standard television. Essentially we are seeing the same story on a television, on a television, which is always fun. There's also a brilliant attention to detail in this scene, which I don't see brought up enough. And that is when she is flipping through the channels and watching the different events play out. The music in the background also changes. When we're in on the Doctor and Co, we hear a fast-paced action theme. But when we see different and quiet bits of the library, there is an atmospheric jingle in the background. But when we see Donna being dragged into the mental hospital, we hear simple yet somehow unnerving, light-hearted drama music. Starting Donna's story off in a mental hospital is a great way to make the audience feel uncomfortable because they don't know what kind of things may have happened to Donna in order for her to end up here. And because we see everything from the editor's intended point of view, the instant cuts, cutting out different bits of time, don't really make as much sense for Donna, as to us they end up on the cutting room floor, but for her, they're an immense lack of normality. This is interesting because it almost makes the editor's hand, who is present in every story, a sort of villain, as we want Donna to stop feeling disorientated and afraid. But in doing that, we are going against a very force that is controlling the story that we are watching. To say this is fourth wall breaking is an understatement. It's bloody fourth, fifth and sixth wall breaking. But this isn't the end of it. Not even close, as things get worse after the time jump, which Donna has now settled and had kids with a house and a husband, all in the space of a matter of minutes. Again, for the audience, this is no disparate different to an ITV hospital drama, but Donna is aware of these cuts and feels the jumps every time they happen. However, she can't say anything, because that is clearly what made her end up in the hospital to begin with. Dr. Moon is clearly a force of good in this story, but in the moment, and from his this perspective, the ways in which he is getting what he wants, stopping Donna from questioning her fragile reality, is heavily manipulative. This means that Moffat's intentions for this to be a, apparently a future incarnation of the Doctor are far more than just a superficial idea or a clumsy afterthought to try and make the story seem better or more deep. Then we get to my favourite part of the episode, in which Donna gets to note through the door from the woman in black, essentially, and the next day heads to the park that is literally inch for inch identical to the one that used to be down the street from where I lived as a kid. The part of the episode I remember being scared of the most when I was younger, when I first watched this, was when the veil is taken off and we see her twisted CGI face. In fact, I remember quite strongly that this image was in Doctor Who Adventures magazine that week. And I was so scared of her, in fact, that I refused to look at the page she was featured in. It was one of the many Russell T Davies era villains that gave me nightmares, and if you need something to blame my somewhat odd behaviour on, then you can put some of the blame here. But 12, Christ, 12, years later, and this acts as an effective jump scare, but nothing compared to the moment in which Donna's reality is pulled down around her. After she realises what has happened to the woman she met in the library, she realises what she has been feeling, the strange moments where days or years disappear at the flick of a light switch. Except her coping mechanism is too strong, as now she refuses to believe this is real. And the emotional impact of her having to learn all of this by discovering her children aren't real, and in fact, there are just hundreds of them, and it's all filled in like dreams in her head. It's just also heartbreaking to watch her just crush as she tries tries to block it all out and just forget all about it but she just can't because she knows deep down that this is the truth there is also that horrifyingly brilliant scene in which the children admit that they know they are not real and donna shuts her eyes to open them again and find that they are gone leading to her breaking down this was especially chilling at the time i first watched this story as i was around the same age as these kids and this is what I was referring to when I said the horror invades your personal life. It implies any of the audience watching of various ages could be in the same existential nightmare as Donna or her children. And it creates a sense of existentialistic horror while also remaining contemporary, which is the aesthetic that the story is going for. I also love the parallel in the concluding scene in which River hands her life over to die, in which the library is slowly filled back with the people who were lost, as both the Doctor and Donna have to say goodbye to the people they quite possibly love for real, before being forced back into their ordinary lives. It's 
twinge with sadness as the life they live is perfectly nice and happy but compared to what they could have had it it it's almost like when you have a dream of a better life one night but when you wake up you feel worse because your normal life can't possibly compare it's essentially like that but on a cosmic scale also tate and tennant's performances are phenomenal here and i just i can't articulate how much credit i need to give them there was also a moment here I would like to mention in which the Doctor is listening to River's monologue about where she tells him about his future. What makes this so sad and the look on the Doctor's face so heartbreaking is that this Doctor is being told that not only is he going to lose the regeneration in which he wants more than anything to settle down, but when he does get another life, he will also lose the next person he falls in love with and yet again be alone. This is the face of a man that is being told directly that he is going to spend the rest of his lives being heartbroken and alone in some kind of twisted wheel of fate. The final moments of this story also fit in with the themes of the Doctor's character that are repeatedly explored over the course of the revival. The Doctor may have saved the day, but at what cost? Except here we get to see this firsthand through Donna's personal experience. Both Donna and the Doctor are quite possibly worse off through this conclusion, but they are both too occupied trying to keep the other happy to give in to the grievance that it deserves. And Christ, that moment where Lee calls out for Donna but can't do to her Sabbath, this chokes me up every goddamn time. This is easily my fans' most heartbreaking and tragic script that, that he ever wrote, and that, that can be a high bar if you look at some of his better ones. This moment for the Doctor and Donna also fits in with what I said about the character of the Doctor in my one fantastic scene video, which is that the characters have to keep on moving no matter what happens because people need them to, and that sometimes, just sometimes, it'll be worth it. Because if the Doctor had just given up, then he wouldn't have been able to save River and feel the worth and satisfaction that the outcome of the struggle he and Donna underwent offers him. And that's all but Christ, I barely scratched the surface of the impact of this story, outside of the specific points I was talking about. For instance, this is the first story where it's confirmed that the sonic screwdriver doesn't work on wood, which I was surprised to discover in quite recently because I remember joking about that all the time from a very young age. It is also the first time we see the Doctor open the TARDIS with his fingers, and it's a very nice and deserved moment here, and I also like seeing it in episodes like The Eleventh Hour and The Pilot. However, I am a little glad it has gone in the recent era, because it was starting to get a bit tiresome, and I think it worked better as a nice rewarding moment every now and then, rather than just an alternative way to open the doors. But here, for the first time, hugely earned and satisfying, and just a truly perfect shot. And that's the end of the video guys, this went on for a while but I'm glad I went with this story first because I was struggling to think of a good episode to start the series off on. This is going to be a series of analysis videos where I look at different examples of horror in Doctor Who and talk about them and sort of like go into depth about why they work because I kind of miss when Doctor Who would be scary rather than just occasionally having a scary episode now and then. And also I just want to do something different to my typical reviews. I was going to do an introduction video but um... I'm actually starting work next week, so I was kind of running out of time and just wanted to get this out quickly. Um, I hope this was an interesting look at the contemporary horror of the story, and let me know if it works, because this is my first video that isn't a review. However, I wouldn't be surprised if I look back over the video as a whole and, uh, and find that I was just giving positive or negative criticism. But anyway, I'm going to start working on the second one as soon as I can. Um, it's going to be analysis, an analysis of cosmic horror. And same as last time, if this video gets 100 or more views, then I will, reveal, I will reveal early on my Twitter account which episode is going to be the focus of that analysis. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'm so glad I finally managed to do this. And um, I hope to see you next time. Till then, goodbye.